time is 1960. The place is Cathedral City, California. Agnes Pelton's studio house and meditation room in the late afternoon. Enter the artist, Agnes Pelton, in her late 70s, obviously hesitant and ill. She has been gathering her mementos to pack and move. This is my little cottage, my creation, my inspiration. This studio and more, the visitors who have come through the door, the paintings on the wall, the views of the mountains through the windows, the scent of jasmine, and the energy of the sun. I truly cannot bear to leave the spirit of this place, but I must. I must pack and go. It is no longer mine. I cannot stay. I am ill, very ill, and I can no longer afford this space. I need rest and peace. My friends have arranged for me a tiny cabin being built behind it does not matter, but oh, oh, how it pains me to leave. How gently the light flickers through the air, like flower petals opening, or the smoky wisps rising from a crater's smoldering lava. Light, warmth, life. How I ache to capture it all on canvas. For light is really all life, you know. It is the center of being. Stargazer, ecstasy, the awakening, the voice, the ray, these pictures, I am sure, are my especial light messages to the world, telling of the soul's journey toward the light. Ah, uh, the question I asked dear friend Raymond Johnson once, do you think there are any more of us who paint with light instead of paint? I have a letter from Raymond Johnson. The first time he ever saw my abstractions, I sent them there for an exhibition to Albuquerque. September 1st, 1933. Dear Miss Pelton, your paintings have arrived here in Albuquerque for the exhibition. You have a new admirer. Your abstractions clicked with me immediately, and when I tell you I spent most of an hour and afternoon all alone with them, looking and looking and ending up with complete acceptance, you will perhaps get some idea of what I would like to say. I remember what I wrote back to him. He was so kind. Dear Mr. Johnson, your beautiful appreciation of my paintings is indeed enough. I never dreamed so real a response. Painters, when they like them ever, are usually guarded and limit themselves to the decorative aspects. That you found they had depths of art value means more to me because whatever their message, they speak through an art form and must measure up to that standard. 
Memories, memories. I had such great plans for exhibition after a little show in Santa Fe the first time in 1919, even before I met Raymond Johnson. Writer Mary Austin was there, and she too was on a spiritual quest. I can't remember all she said in her introduction to my exhibition, but I know that she found the light in my work and was moved by it. New Mexico certainly brings back memories, some better than others, and most are centered on Mabel Dodge Lujan, the grand dame, the patron of art and artists. How the memory of her home and Taos is oh so clear. Mabel was such a character when Alice Thursby and I found our way to Taos back in 1919 to visit her and the Pueblo Indian Tony that she was living with at the time, I thought I had found the most beautiful of lost lands. The sky was expansive and the mountains so infused with shadows and colors, colors as vibrant as precious jewels when the sun shone. Alice and I stayed with Mabel for a month that time breathing in the fresh air and trying to capture the aged, restorative spirit of that land. I painted subjects that I'd never painted before. Donkeys, Indian children from the Taos Pueblo, landscapes of desert and sky. One afternoon, I stood on the hill, looking. And the wind was blowing, and I was in awe of it all. Mabel came up to me and put her son John's jacket around my shoulders, and she said, come inside, it's cold. I said, not yet. The sun is setting, and there is glory here. I remember Mabel's letters. She used to put rosemary in the envelope, and that triggered memories of our times together. Summer 1921, Mabel went back to New York to visit from Taos. She was so pleased. We both went to see faith healer Mrs. Emma Curtis Hopkins. She was a disciple of Mary Baker Eddy. Both Mabel and I suffered from depression of sorts. Mabel and I shared in many ways. I would wait in those early years for her letters. The sage triggered fond memories of our closeness together. Only Mabel knew of that certain absorption that I had in my life. Living alone is difficult, but sometimes that's the only way. Mostly, I prefer to be alone. As I wrote Mabel later, that need for others seemed to disappear when I moved to the windmill on Long Island. There I was isolated, but happy. Wonderful Mabel, life of the party, light of life. Even when she and Tony visited me years later here in California, I think of her often as we had some real life together. <clears throat> this photograph of Tony Luhan. This was such, such an effort. This painting of Tony Luhan, her husband. Painting from a photograph, the lowest of low art forms. <laughs> but I managed to do it. And this likeness of Mabel's Tony was one of my first photographic efforts. However, portraiture did pay for some lovely times. Trips to Louisville, Georgia to paint the Easterlin family, bank people, 
Southern hospitality. I so enjoyed the six months that I lived there. And six year old, oh, she was so precocious, darling little Frances. I sent her this postcard of my windmill home. More memories. But work was necessary, always. Portraits were to be my bread and butter in the 1920s. I remember little William and his sister, Anne Louise. Let's see, that was in the 1920s when the world seemed fine. I traveled to Europe, to Italy to study. I went west to Hawaii to visit relatives there. I even did some portraits of the lovely local children. Portraits were a way to make money. And even in them, I tried to add touches, elements that illumined the character, like the wicker chair in dear Jane Levington Comfort's picture, or her jewelry, or the vase of globe flowers. Flowers have always been a part of my work. There is meaning in flowers, you know, and I selected and executed them carefully. In Incarnation, a work I did for Jane, in Nurture, an abstraction of life and growth, and some real florals, too. I remember when I sketched myself nude, holding a rose. Oh, my. American beauty, I was not. But surely all the grace and the loveliness of a woman's lines are repeated in the outline of the blossom. Flowers. Flowers, such a part of my work. I saved my mother's little language of flowers book. It has the definitions. She taught me these definitions as we nurtured the garden flowers. Hmm. Aloe stands for grief. Bachelor buttons for celibacy. Basil is hatred. Daisies are for innocence. Hydrangeas mean boastful. Zinnias are for long lost friends. I wonder if I'm the only one who remembers these now. When floral painting was the rage, everyone knew the definitions. I thought the title of my painting, Morning Glories, was simply too obvious. But it did capture the maiden's fleeting moments of youthfulness, her exuberance, hope, and beauty, all these so transient there on the mountaintop. And everyone then knew that Morning Glories meant the very fleeting loveliness of life. But the good moments in life were often fleeting for us too, weren't they, Mother? I remember how our house in Brooklyn was so quiet when I was a child. How Grandmother Tilton would allow no noise, no visitors, no life inside the rooms. Except when Mother's piano students, of course, were taking lessons. Or when the ladies' circle came once a week for that long, droning hour. Otherwise, we were cooped up, silenced, and contained. I know. Grandmother Tilton was destroyed by the trial, the publicity, the shame, the lies and half-truths that put her life on trial forever linked adulterously with the famous preacher, Henry Ward Beecher. Oh, how difficult it was for her, for you, Mother, who fled to Europe to avoid the scandal, and the whole awful story 
It pains me too, mother, and I was not yet born. I do suppose I'm grateful you met father there, but then that's another sad story, isn't it? Some days, depression takes hold of me and squeezes energy from every pore. I cannot breathe, I cannot move, I cannot think, even now. The pain of cancer is crushing, and I know the end of my life is near, and I cannot stop the memories from pouring forth, the few successes, but oh, the many failures. Have I accomplished what was meant to be? Have I served with talents given me? Even as a, a young artist in New York with such promise, in New York City's Armory Show in 1913, my work was shown along with Picasso, Matisse, Cezanne, Kandinsky, and so many other brilliant modern artists. I believed in my talent then. My reviews and private exhibitions were exhilarating. I was called a harbinger of the future for other painter poets. I memorized these lines. Reviewers noted in my paintings a strong personal note, a rare feeling for composition and harmony of color. I tried so hard on my own to be successful in New York City. My mother was a gallant and beautiful character who spent her entire life in unselfish devotion to me and my art. But so few times was mother truly happy. Mostly she was not. She recorded everything in her journal. And I read it to remind of the struggles that I had back then. Hmm. Here it is. Her damning list, oh forgive me, her list of failures, and all of these within a few months of when I was 33. February 16, 1916, Agnes took her full-page pen and ink satire eugenics to Mr. Crowenshield of Vanity Fair, who replied on February 12th, very regretfully, I am returning your drawings because I cannot find a place for them. February 17th, Agnes took two colored designs for postcards to luck, but the woman wouldn't negotiate with her at all. Agnes took romance to the National Academy it was accepted, but alas, not hung. Agnes showed romance on March 19th to Macbeth and also to Montrose. Neither gallery wanted it. Macbeth said it was too crude. Montrose couldn't use it. Even earlier, mother copied a letter I still cringe when I read this. It was from a woman who in 1914 had purchased my painting, Cry in the Night. Dear Miss Pelton, I find that my husband and children have a peculiar feeling about your splendidly imaginative Cry in the Night. And I am wondering whether you would be willing to let me have another of your pictures in its place. Some subject that is perhaps more cheerful to live with. <laughs> is that very dreadful of me? Personally, I deeply value the beauty of this work. You will probably love to have it back again. <laughs> now, please. Be as frank as I am, and say anything you like to me. <laughs> Cordially, Clara Manis. Be frank, say anything. 
How could I really? To end it, I simply exchanged cry for something more cheerful. Oh, surely that is my purpose in art. As I remember, this frustrating, difficult time was followed by several glorious moments. I opened my studio on East 59th Street in New York City, and I was invited to membership in the Association of Women Painters and Sculptors. And I also joined the independent artist and exhibited with the introspectives at the Needler Gallery in 1917. I knew my painting was different from most. Superficial surface art, however excellent the craftsmanship, was not my goal. I have always believed the art of painting should convey through its language of color the without seen from the within. It was so hard in New York then, a single woman, one without a serious patron, Oh, my friend Alice Brisbane Thursby tried, but she had her own difficulties. So emotionally unpredictable. One day we'd ride to lunch in her touring car. The next day she'd be at home in the dark with neurasthesia nerves. I tried everything to be successful, even to pay my rent for the studio. I even illustrated a child's book for Zona Gale in 1913. I was thrilled to get the opportunity. Zona Gale was a popular author then, very popular, and I worked weeks on the illustrations for when I was a little girl. My copy. It's beautiful. And then I received a letter from the editor. And he said, Dear Miss Pelton, you must change the illustration for page 317 as Miss Gale feels it will frighten the children. Heavens, why blame me? I only painted what I saw in her words. Oh well, I did as I was told. I redrew the image, shadowing the monster and highlighting the child and sent it off with a succinct apology. And that was that. I was never asked to illustrate another child's story or any other book for that matter. One thing led to another, or in mother's thoughts, one disappointment piled in on the one previous. At one point, Alice thought it would be a good idea to advertise my painting skills to some of her elite Fifth Avenue friends. I could make room decorations, she said, for their apartments. Enormous panels, Art Nouveau and such. I sketched, I painted examples, I developed and displayed brochures, and only one or two of her friends responded. One week, I took illustrations and physically set out to badger every editor within miles. There was simply no room for me. Living in New York, even with a satisfactory studio, I still went home to mother's every night. Her silence was worse than her criticism. I felt that I had failed despite my talents. I longed for something different, for a change. These feelings and the tragic events of the war weighed heavily upon me in 1917, and I began to withdraw from the business of painting. And I spent the next two years at the family farm in Killingsworth, Connecticut, growing vegetables. Perhaps I needed the solitude. 
of that place, living away from the city, to allow my own symbolic visions to germinate, to grow. I knew I needed to be away from my mother's control, and I needed my own space. But my life changed so drastically when she died in 1920. I was almost 40, and I was alone. Our house in Brooklyn had to be sold. I needed to relocate and restore my soul. Fortunately, on Long Island, I found the perfect place, the windmill. <coughs> The postcard of the windmill. I did so love living there. It was the center of my life. Things radiated to and from it. I think one of my best paintings is the windmill and the garden. Painting home is comforting. The 10 years that I lived in the windmill studio, I was grateful to work, painting so many portraits of the children of the Southampton summer families. A successful exhibition led to more portrait work and travels. At the windmill, I tended to my garden, fed the pigeons, and enjoyed the solitude. But oh, not the cold, cold, heatless winters. It was there I started to think of sunshine and desert warmth. For certain, it was my trip to Pasadena in 1928 and that stay with Will Comfort's glass hive that moved me toward my true calling, the spiritual quest, my search for guiding light. In Pasadena that year, I began in earnest to create spiritual images on canvas like Lotus for Lida after a trip to the Huntington Gardens. I heard of Will Comfort's glass hive from my friend Emma Newton we shared a long time love and thought of theosophy and its emphasis on knowledge and good work. Living on the knob in Pasadena one spring was invigorating. I dearly loved Will Comfort's daughter, Jane, and the atmosphere there was energizing. It was as if art, religion, and intellect swirled all around us. The Glass Hive pamphlet, which I continued to receive for several years, touched my interests in astrology, Agni Yoga, the cosmos, even communism, and our need for a new race. Mostly, though, I was interested in its views on art and expression. From the Hive. Will Levington Comfort, editor, April 1928, edition number seven. What is art then? It is to put the spirit in the picture, examining outwardly, inquiring inwardly. I become the medium between the spirit and the matter of things. That's exactly what I believed that the abstract images I created were my windows to my inner world. I think Stargazer is one of my most powerful images conceived during that time. The cobalt blue is beautiful, growth at dawn in the desert mountains, and always the upward movement toward the ever-present star, a guiding light. Poet John Keats knew, bright star would I were steadfast as thou art. Be steadfast, keep one's nose to the grindstone, as mother would say, continue day by day, that's the only way art is created. But oh, sometimes it was so difficult. I worked on abstractions for years, perfecting the layers of glaze so light would reflect both inner and outer worlds. Often I sensed my life is guided by outside forces, what I painted, where I lived, 
When circumstances changed abruptly for me in 1929 and the windmill studio was sold, I was almost 50 years old. 10 years on Long Island and now where to go? Forced to move, I wavered between Honolulu or Santa Barbara where I had relatives, or Pasadena with my friends from the Glass Hive, or somewhere new like Cathedral City. In a way, it was an easy choice. I needed a better climate for my health, and I wanted inspiration for my art. The mountains here, the San Jacinto and the San Gorgonio, are part of a spiritual chain. This valley is the entrance to the kingdom. Oh my, that does sound strange in this day and age. But in the 1930s, there were many of us who were looking for the portal to the promised land. Will Comfort believed it was here. I believed it too. Remember the gates on the highway? They exist in my abstraction future too. I do know that Cathedral City was a friendly place and a receptive place, and early on I held teas and open houses in the studio. I joined organizations and truly felt a part of this community. Like others, I had a cabin in the mountains, although I preferred to stay here in the desert heat longer than most. My neighbors, Willard and Mary Price, Mary Wolseth, Virginia Smith, the Hillarys, Jerry Goodall have been so good to me, helping me with business issues, mortgages, and insurance, providing transportation and care. Irvin Cornelia Sussman, too, bless them all. I think, too, of Harriet Day in the Desert Inn Art Gallery. She supported my work, all. And of Claude and Edna Cobb, who asked me to paint something to advertise their date farm. I worked on those images for many frustrating days, painting date seeds up close. It was very difficult for me, very difficult. It is always all wrong to paint just for money. You know, some think the desert is a dry and dusty place. I have always found it so full of everything. I always wanted to paint light and life. Whether a true picture of the landscape or an image abstracted from it, the desert provided both. Sometimes I painted the photograph. Sometimes my imagined desert. Most of all, I found peace and comfort here in Cathedral City. Except perhaps during the war, I was so afraid. Here in the desert, we took preparations for the expected invasion. A dive bombing unit was installed at the airport, and local men joined air raid squadrons and patrolled the skies from desert towers. Even our hospital was readied for convalescing soldiers. Constantly we were on call, vigilant. I felt unable to paint, imaginatively. It was easier to reproduce the landscape. I had a great fear for my abstractions, my children. We were in daily danger. I even had a tiny storage room built under the West Ramada to put the pictures in for safekeeping so they would not be all over the floor should an air raid sound. War is fearful and ugly and difficult to express, even before our part of the war. The world was so disturbing that it felt as if one were hanging on by one's fingernails. I do recall one painting prelude that was commissioned during that time, and I worked on it toward the end of the war, trying to give shape 
and image to what was happening to all of us. The gears, like the wheels of the tanks, suppress the landscape. Nature is torn asunder, with the land turning blue and the sky a sickly yellow. But mostly my life in this desert, in this community, has been full. Painting abstractions as they came to me, working on the landscapes to sell to tourists, always a conflict of time and energy. But I must meet the economic necessity as best one may. The spirit of this place is exquisite and full of diversity, and if I can pay my way in life by interpreting it to some extent, it will be a fortunate way indeed. And oh, the abstractions are so necessary. Though I accomplish little sometimes, it is so blessed to be at it, like painting with a moth's wing and with music instead of paint. This house has meant so much to me for 25 years. There is a spirit that encourages me here. Over there in my medita meditation room, there's the creative source. Even in the sultry afternoons with Mother of Silence watching me, I can lie on my couch and experience the cold, brittle air that opens drafts to the spirit as well as to the body in bright moments of quietude. At dusk, with the light filtering through the window, I often waited for images to form. These are my windows to an inner realm, the exploration of places not yet visited. Once I've moved these images to canvas, they become a new way of seeing. This cottage, this room, all surround me like a garment and have given me so much comfort that the work that I do here is, well, worthy. Despite my disparate needs to paint the landscapes, to feed the body, or to create the abstractions to nurture the spirit, without a doubt, the spirit's call is stronger. I remember a passage I wrote in my journal about that very thing. Mm. Here it is. November 19th, 1942, about 6.30 p.m. Resting in twilight after reading Dostoevsky, a quietness, thinking if I should go on and start a landscape or continue with an abstraction, and feeling poorly, can I do my best with them? Still deeper quiet, and it seemed there was a presence, shadowy but real, and if so, is this he? It seemed so, and this is my first such intimation. It was an artist's presence of deep, gentle power, remote, but directed at me. So it seemed the abstractions must go on, not to stop them ever from discouragement. And so I shall. Mm. Oh my, <laughs> I have taken so much of your time. I do apologize. This afternoon, and in fact, these past few years have just flown by. Don't you feel it too? The very worst thing about life is the way that yesterday leaps over one's head and becomes tomorrow. Mm. My goodness, here I am, an aging spinster who talks very badly, far worse than even I write. Hmm. 
forgive me. Please, won't you have some tea? I think I have some scones in the cabinet over there. Perhaps some figs from the garden. Hmm. I wish I could provide a bit more, but the old bank account leaked out again this month. Hmm. Never mind. Come join me and the spirits of this house that have given so much to all our lives. Enough of this fuss. You know when you have a subject like Agnes Pelton, and I fell in love with her when I saw a stargazer in the catalog from Zakian's exhibition, and I was on a total different track for my PhD and my dissertation. I saw Pelton, I did a short paper on Pelton, I fell in love with all the work that she did, and I had no idea of the depth of what she did and her life. Her life is amazing, it's powerful, it's inspirational, even if it seems to have ended a bit sadly. Here we are celebrating Agnes Pelton, and I am so grateful to Simeon and to Peter because I would not be here if they had not purchased this house. <laughs> and we have all come together, and you've heard that story, and it's wonderful. And to have all of you here, and even to enjoy it a bit, is really wonderful for me. Thank you.
Clearly. It's both. I found myself, you know, and I'm not spiritual particularly, but suddenly you begin to really feel yeah. a whole lot differently Absolutely. than you did before. Absolutely. So and, and you were the perfect vehicle for it. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and as an actress, you, you were just... No, I'm not an actress. I'm a professor. I teach but, short but you, stories. You don't. Ju you, <laughs> you don't. Oh, this, this was teaching at its finest. Oh, I am just such a fan. Well, what's your name? Oh, my name's Mickey Welch. You're Mickey, Mickey Welch. Welch. Okay, uh, thank you. Oh my God. Thank you. And to be able to listen to you, I couldn't see your face much because, and, but I looked at that, and, and then there were two slides, and, and, and to be and right here in her place. And, yeah, oh, it is. It's amazing and, to and, be and, here. And, I'm, I'm a writer and, and my partner's a parent and, and we, we, we both have been having the exact same problems with failure and all that stuff and, 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 and whoa. I, well, I even feel like I patterned my life after her because she moved here when she was 50 and that's when I went back to graduate school and then I moved to California and then I'm like Helton is all my life. So. Thank you. And, and, and that, that Harriet Ward Beecher, he was an Episcopal pre, a minister, wasn't he, uh, in Boston? Yeah, super well, famous. In, yeah. Super important. Very. I mean, he, Harriet Beecher Stowe was his sister. Oh, is that And right? they're from this big family yeah. of preachers. And he got off pretty well yeah, clear. And, and, and she got tarred. Yeah. She got, yeah, Thank hard and so feathered much. practically. I'd like to see you again. Okay, okay. You're a wonderful audience person. <laughs> I just Thank love you. when I see people with faces that look like they might be getting what I'm saying. <laughs> Get it? I imbibed it. Oh, I'm floating on the ceiling right now. Thank you. Because I intuit so much of your story is universal. It is. It's it universal. is. It's, Everyone it's, can feel it and be part of it because that's our nature right there. Yeah. This the star in her paintings. Everyone is it's different. It's a spiritual eye. She saw the spiritual eye. She did. 